It's time for Paleo Radio, only on Secular Media Network. You are now entering Paleo Radio. Welcome to Paleo Radio live here in WPRR Studios, 95.3 FM, 1680 AM Grand Rapids, and also affili- an affiliate of Secular Media Group. I am Joe Elder, carrying a live show of Paleo Radio here today. It's going to be fun and exciting, and hopefully you guys can contribute. The telephone number here is 616-656-1680. Feel free to call and join in at any time. The four topics that we're going to be diving into, really good ones here. First is going to be a Rolling Stone article, The Return of Lesser Evilism, kind of concentrated on Hillary Clinton and Senator Bernie Sanders' race here in the Democratic national elections. And then we are going to be continuing on with the Rubin Report, having an interview with Fasal Saeed Al-Mutar, who is a previous citizen of Iraq, who pushes for economic and Muslim reform in the Middle East. And he talks about his issues with Islam and also his issues with the liberal left not necessarily helping him. Third, we're going to speak about, obviously, the Brexit and how fun and exciting that was. Um, the positives and negatives of what a Brexit means and what it, it means to have 60 million people leave the 500 million populace of the European Union. And the very last topic, we are going to have our buddy Jeremiah Bannister call in and give us an update on Team Tiny Dancer, the status of Sammy and his family, and what's going on there. So first, we're going to bust right into the Rolling Stone article. The Return of Lesser Evilism, this is by Matt Taibbi. With Trump on the other side, Democrats can be lazier than ever this election. He begins with, It would be foolish to argue that Nader's run in 2000 didn't enable Bush's presidency. Though there were other factors, Nader's presence on the ballot was surely a big one. But the career Democrats of the Beltway and their buddies in the press have turned the Nader episode into something like the very creation story of the third-way political movement. And like many religious myths, it's gotten very tiresome. Democratic Party leaders have trained their following to perceive everything in terms of one single endgame equation. If you don't support us, you're supporting Bush, Rove, Cheney, Palin, insert evil Republican here. That the monster of the movement, Donald Trump, the one we see now, is a lot more monstrous than usual and will likely make this argument an an even bigger part of the Democratic Party platform going forward. It's a sound formula for making ballot box decisions – But the people who push it never seem to consent to just use it to win elections. They're continually trying to make an ethical argument out of it to prove to people who defy the equation that they are, whether they know it or not, morally wrong and in a league with the other side. Which there's a lot of good content here. One thing that I really like is just the acknowledgement of the difference between Beltway Democrats and the people who vote for them. And I've I've been saying on the show, I've also been saying on Southpaws for some time, that there is a definite connection between the fact that the Republican Party assumes that many people on the left are going to vote for them just by default because the other side is so just abhorrently awful. And we know that that is, that is true, and in this election it's absolutely true. But the biggest problem of that is, does that mean Democrats are going to work hard for us and are they going to appeal to what we want or are they going to appeal to the needs and wishes of the constituency, especially when they know that they've got you in a situation. I think Matt Taibbi is just nailing it on the head here. That's why, as a socially liberal person who probably likes trees and wouldn't want to see Roe versus Wade overturned, Nader's decision to take votes from the party-blessed candidate Gore is viewed as not as dissent, but as a kind of treason. The problem with this line of thinking is that there's no end to it. If you think I owe you my vote because I recycle and I enjoyed to kill a mockingbird, you're not going to work very hard to keep it. And that's particularly true of the only standard that you think you'll need to worry about this year. The former camp refuses to be funded by the Goldmans and Pfizer's of the world, while the latter camp embraces those donors. This is when Taibbi basically is breaking down the difference of why Bernie Sanders voters are having some resentment with voting for Hillary Clinton. I'll say it again. The former camp refuses to be funded by the Goldman Sachs and Pfizer's of the world, while the latter camp embraces those donors. That's really all this comes down to. 
There's nothing particularly radical about not taking money from companies you think you might need to regulate someday. And there's nothing particularly centrist or realistic about taking that same money. When I think about the ways the Democrats and their friends in the press keep telling me how I owe them their vote, situations like the following come to mind. We're in another financial crisis. The CEOs of the 10 biggest banks in America, fresh from having wrecked the economy with the latest harebrained bubble scheme, come to the Oval Office begging for a bailout. In that moment, to whom is my future Democratic president going to listen? Those bankers or me? It's not going to be me, that's for sure. I'm an egotist for being annoyed by that. And how exactly should I be taking or being told that on top of that I still owe this party my vote and that I should keep my mouth shut about the irritation if I don't want to be called a Republican enabler? The collapse of Republican Party, the collapse of the Republican Party, and its takeover by the nativist Trump wing poses all sorts of problems, not the least of which being the high likelihood that Democrats will grow even lazier when it comes to responding to their voters' interests. The crazier Republicans get, the more reflexive will be the arguments that we can't afford any criticism of Democrats anymore, lest we invite in the Fourth Reich. And I think that's the biggest concern here. If you guys have an example or you want to call in to chime into the conversation, the number here is 616-656-1680. But that is the, the biggest issue here is how hard is the Democratic Party going to work for you and for your vote the crazier the Republicans get? Because the fact of the matter is, when the Republicans go farther and farther to the right, it makes it easier and easier to gain that vote by default. And we're looking at a serious, serious situation here where we may have uh, the other end of this argument is that people don't show up to vote for Trump because they're assuming that so many people will vote against him that they're going to come and cast their ballot for Hillary, that they don't need to be involved in the process. And therein lies the problem is how do you get more people to be democratically connected and or just connected in any way shape or form if you're not even talking from the party platform how do you as a politician or someone interested in american politics how do you get more people to come to the ballot and actually get what they want to say heard how do you get that voice out there and i think that there's plenty of problems in that i think that we have a serious issue with republicans we have a serious issue with donald trump we know that donald trump is bringing in some ideas of the yesteryears that we definitely don't want to see. And I think by default that does bring a lot of people in the center over to Hillary Clinton. But then when we get Hillary Clinton, what do we expect out of her? Do we say that just because she's not Trump, we can close our eyes now and go to bed for four more years or eight even? Because I think that's the biggest problem is there's plenty of work to do and we need a lot more hands on deck. And the more we have disassociation between our main parties, the more we'll have people that are in the middle that are indifferent and they aren't active, and then you get serious status quo politics. And I've said this before, without a doubt, if I had to choose between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, I will absolutely choose Hillary Clinton. But I'm not saying that after I choose Hillary Clinton, I'm not going to hold her accountable and act like I expect her to be better than she has been, because honestly, I think she's kind of a deplorable candidate myself. But I know that there's an important meaning in voting for someone like Hillary Clinton, especially when you look at what's on the other side. But, again, driving the point home, what do you do after she gets the election or what do you do after you say, yes, I'm going for Clinton? Do we say we're okay with her rampant drone program that she plans on continuing on? Do we talk against that or, or do we just kind of all go to bed again? That's, that's what I think is the major issue here. Going on in the article again. So the party gets most of its funding without having to beg door to door, and it gets most of its votes by default. Except for the campaign trail photo ops, mainstream Democrats barely need to leave Washington to stay in business. Dissenting voices like this year's version of Nader, Bernie Sanders, are inevitably pitched by these egotists who don't have the guts to go and take it to the win. They're described out as just as going for their 15 minutes of fame and maybe a few uh, people, a few groups of teenagers and hippies who will gush over their far-out idealism. But that characterization is inaccurate. The primary difference between the Nader-Sanders platform and the Gore-Clinton platform isn't rooted in ideology at all, but in money. And there's another article that I've grouped in with this that actually really drives that point home. It's an article out of CNBC. Wall Street casher Elizabeth Warren, Hillary's Choice. The article is written by Ben White. Um, again, CNBC.com. Wall Street has an unambiguous message for Hillary Clinton. Don't pick Elizabeth Warren as your vice president if you want to keep getting our money. 
That warning came through very clear in over a dozen interviews I did over the last week with some of the largest Democratic donors on Wall Street who have helped fund Clinton's campaign over the years as well as funneled cash to Bill Clinton's political career in the 1990s. Quote, if Clinton picked Warren, her whole base on Wall Street would leave her, one top Democratic donor who had helped raise millions for her had told me. Quote, they literally just won't stay. We have no qualms with you moving left. We understand all things you've had to do because of Bernie Sanders. But if you're going to go with Warren, we just can't trust you. You've killed it. So that goes into the point of when Matt Taibbi says that the 10 largest bankers in the next huge crisis that we have go into the Oval Office and they ask Hillary Clinton for help, who's she going to listen to? I think we know the answer to that. And I think this this example proves the point. Elizabeth Warren is one of the most vocal people talking about how Wall Street is inept and needs more regulation and needs to be saddled and and pushed back a little bit. And Wall Street openly says, hey, Hillary, if you're not going to play ball with us or you're going to want to play ball with Hillary, we're done with you. The arguments, of course, are mostly self-serving. The financial services industry loathes Warren who more than anyone in the past 80 years has channeled the rage against Wall Street that began with the Great Depression and continues to course through the nation following the 2008 financial crisis. Warren wants to break up the nation's largest banks. She created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. The mere mention of her name draws groans and groans from bankers. But there is at least a bit of substance here to these arguments. Bankers believe Clinton, should she win, will have an opportunity to make deals with Republicans in Congress to pass major infrastructure spending coupled with international tax reforms during her first months in office. And they will thank Warren in the VP's office for making any such cuts or deals harder. They will think that Warren will make these deals harder, which she obviously will. The more that banking wants to spread their arms into different industries, Elizabeth Warren's going to keep her eye out for that. Quote, Clinton is going to face a divided government. Unless there's a total tsunami, said one moderate Washington Democrat with close ties to the banking industry. If you want a vice president and someone who can negotiate for you on the Hill, someone like Joe Biden, take someone like him. It's not a war in strength. The bankers I spoke to also said that they thought there was no chance Clinton would tap Warren. The arguments? The two don't really get along. Clinton would never pick a number two who could outshine her. And Clinton doesn't want a VP who would create her own power center in both the campaign and the White House, which is very likely true if Warren were to run with her. Going into the article again, quote, First of all, they don't particularly like each other, another prominent head fund manager said. The absolute predicate for a vice president nominee is that they understand that they're the number two during the campaign and once you take office. And I just don't think Elizabeth Warren is that type of person. So there's a lot of people that draw Elizabeth Warren as this type of Rambo-esque woman who's just running in there with her bullets strapped and just firing a blaze into uh, all these bankers. But that's just simply not the case. They're threatened by her because she's seriously thinking about regulating them and seriously think about putting them under the governmental structure. And at this point, bankers think that they and the government see eye to eye in terms of regulation where the bankers have an input, the government has an input, but at the end of the day, they all sit at the table and make their own agreements. And that's just simply not how Warren sees it. The way she sees it is top-down, the proper way, where the government dictates and regulates the market, and the bankers follow the rules or pay the penalties for it. And I, I really would love to see Hillary Clinton tap Elizabeth Warren. I don't think it would happen either. Just for the basis of Hillary's been in the game for a long time, We know exactly what we're going to get out of Hillary, and we know that she doesn't pull these type of stunts when she's this close to winning something she's been trying to win for years. She's going to play ball and stick into her lane, and she's going to work with Pfizer and Goldman Sachs and take the money, and then she's going to negotiate deals with Wall Street when she gets the presidency. And we know that's going to be how this rolls out. So as as much as I would love to think that Warren could be her VP, I just don't see it in the cards. The financial considerations for Clinton are significant. Picking Warren could seriously deflate a major source of her campaign cash, well der. According to the Center of Responsive Politics, Clinton and outside groups support her, supporting her have raised $289 million so far in the 2016 campaign. The securities and investments industry is easily Clinton's top sp- source for money, donating over $28 million so far. So, yes, we can obviously see that there's some contributions in this, in this camp. But proponents of Warren said a bunch of Wall Street bankers whining would actually boost the Massachusetts senator's chances of getting the VP slot. Quote, great piece. One prominent progressive emailed on Monday. I'm sure we'll be circulating some of the golden quotes from Wall Street. 
The progressives also have noted that Warren's selection could lead to a massive outpouring of small-dollar grassroots donations to the campaign that could more than recoup the money that was lost by Wall Street. In addition, rich liberals who like Warren would be more likely to cut big checks to the DNC and outside groups backing the presumptive Democratic nominee. One Democrat close to the Clinton campaign said the Wall Street donor story was great for Warren's chances. Quote, I can't think of a dumber strategy to derail Warren than a bunch of Wall Street execs saying she's unacceptable. Literally like the story couldn't be better for her if she planted it. Um, We were going to have to go to a quick break here. Uh, Stick around. We have plenty more to talk about. If anything, we can continue a little bit about Elizabeth Warren. Um, But next topic is going to be Fail Saud Al-Mutar and and David Rubin discussing Islam and the liberal left. It's going to be fantastic. Stick around. We will see you guys in a little bit. Love Paleo Radio? Join the club. Support our work by visiting patreon.com slash paleo radio today. Back to Eagle and Dragon. Welcome back to Paleo Radio, live here in studio at 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, Grand Rapids, WPRR. We've got a call on the line. Warren, how are you doing, Warren? I'm fine. Good. What did you have to talk about Clinton? I wanted to answer about that. You know, you said, well, if we got the the lesser of two evils elected, then we got to hold her to it like you're going to do. The only thing is, I'm watching uh, the same thing when they talked about Obama. And so, you know, we had the largest march, I think, ever in Washington, where 10,000 people, 100,000 people against the XL pipeline. He said, well, that worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but nobody knows, never, never publishes the fact that he was expediting the other end of the same pipeline, and they bypassed it now. And then when he did finally sign against it and the environmental impact, uh, that actually worked out in favor for the XL group because they now um, can sue us under NAFTA Absolutely. And, and, and get the same profits without having to actually build the pipeline. So, you know, you can't hold him to it, even when you march at 100,000, the largest ever in Washington. There's, and he's going to sign the, uh, that trade agreement, TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm-hmm. as soon as he gets a chance. And everybody's against it. Everybody, the, the public the, the, and the, the Congress, and he's still going to do it. You can't hold him to it. Yeah. I have a question. This is just a general observation, but don't you think in order to get politicians to be held to standard that the public will have to bail out on them in voting? Like, as awful as this would be, and I'm not condoning it, but if people didn't come out to vote for Hillary Clinton and didn't support her because they weren't happy with her and they didn't come out to support Trump, what would that do to politics in terms of trying to garnish the voters back? That would actually that could possibly produce change. But if she wins it by default, how in the world are we going to get her to do what we're seriously asking to have changed? And I'm trying to remember what Ralph Nader said on the Nader Hour last Wednesday. Um, he says that they've got a thing about breaking through to power dot com or something, breaking through the power or something. There's about four different activist type organizations, and I haven't had time to peruse those areas. So there's something he's got as far as strategy. But he definitely said he doesn't tell anybody who he's voting for, but he did say he wouldn't vote for a lesser of two evils and yeah. he wouldn't vote for <laughs> he yeah. did pretty much tell you. Well that's a, yeah, and that's a it's a great point, Warren. I think you're tapping on something too where we have a bigger problem here, and that's we need more political, not even activism, just people being involved in politics in the general way to get politicians to be held accountable. When we have 30 to 40 percent of our constituency come out to vote on elec- in elections, even if it's a state election, that's awful. And that's why people can run ran shot when they get into the that's office. That's true, true. But then also don't forget um, – there's no way that uh, you can casually get the information. I Absolutely. didn't know about this radio station until maybe two years ago, and I accidentally voted for that the dictator of Michigan uh, sure. the first time. I had no idea except from probably what I got from television and PBS. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. I mean, I was a totally ignorant. Oh, you know, and I'm not. I've been liberal. I've, been, I've got a graduate a sociology degree from Grand Valley. And it's a liberal college. And, you know, I didn't, have, I didn't spend the time, didn't know where to go. Same with Obama. I didn't know they, they had full biographies and stuff about him. I could have looked up. He didn't lie to anybody. He was what he was. He grew up with the banksters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, people, no yeah and, and people that were surprised by it felt like they were deceived. But he, like many other politicians, and, you know, it. I'm I'm not one to go say that I think Obama is the greatest ever. He's done, a, he's done a lot of good. He's done a lot of bad. And a lot of the bad he did, we pretty much knew was going to happen. 
He, we knew that he was in – when he runs for a second election with Mitt Romney and his number one contributor is Goldman Sachs and Romney's yep. number two contributor is Goldman Sachs, we know that the game is up, right? And so – And when you were running Kerry against Bush and they're both Skull and Bones members and <laughs> – Sure. You know, <laughs> you got to figure out something's going – The, the biggest for, thing uh, is – Random access. chance here. Sure. And get – you know, there's a time at which uh, nobody believed – they thought it was conspiracy theory when uh, they talked about Bilderberger Society – and then suddenly, it, they started believing it and said, oh, yeah, that's old news. Yeah. But it only happened after the video got hit the mainstream, finally, of all these people like Hillary and everybody, um, chancellors and Bill Gates, pulling up in their ca- cars. Uh, no, no, none of this was scheduled visits. And, the, and this actually sure. was Alex Jones, the well, one they mock all the time and, about being all rightist. Yeah, He's well, the one that actually broke the story. The thing I say, a two parts thing. One is one is good, and one I don't know how you'll take it, but either way, um, one with Alex Jones is the reason why I've I've always looked at him and been skeptical is like, yeah, a blind squirrel will find a nut. He may have found, he may have got <laughs> that. You know what I mean? But he doesn't. Everything is a conspiracy theory. Oh, I know, right? I know. Right? Well, everything but, is. By the way, I've been in three several life sizes of businesses, <laughs> and I don't think you can point one. Everything from a local neighborhood cooperative uh, to the state government. I worked at the GAO. Uh, there, there is. There is no place that we weren't yeah. getting a different story we're telling the public than what yeah. we're in One the thing, inside. Yeah. And I was in the computer and tell IT services. So Sure. Well, yeah, that's, but, yeah, NSA, that's a whole different is, group. You know, let's say he, he made a couple of bad ones where he did a, a scenario and people thought it was a fact, and that's where he really stepped in it. And the rest of it, of course, he's pushing the, the very edge. But don't forget, every one of our CIA directors, they've got a book in the library out from one of our former CIA heads, and it was pushing the edge or something. That means edge of legality sure because well, he's being proactive that's what they think sure. proactive means well and i think what we have too is there's a lot of people that are and i'm not suggesting you're one of them Warren. i'm just saying this as a matter of fact since we're talking about conspiracy theories there's a lot of people that believe in in plenty of conspiracy theories um i myself i have one of my own which i think is the scariest one of all is that instead of groups that are all elaborating and getting together and making these decisions and laying them out that there's actually not even there's no one there making the decisions. Like if we're on a boat, we're all running around looking for the captain, and there's not even a captain on the boat. There's well, that's nobody the steering. Standardization problem of corporations when the philosophy became uh, where you could that you could pocket the bonus bonuses and stuff from the top executives. They began to use the rhetoric of optimization or maximization of shareholder profit, mm-hmm. and, and that's never written in the charters. And they pretend it is. Yep. It, yeah, well, and, I think and people... once you get rid of some of these incentivizations, there's a couple of economists that wrote these books called Super Freakonomics and mm-hmm. Freakonomics and How to Rob a Bank and all that. These guys, they, they said you can just about incentivize any solution you need. Yeah. Um, and I don't know whether that would be true or not. Well, I think that's really what we deal with is they call it the tragedy of the commons, right? When you have a common space that's shared, just statistically, there's going to be a group of people who take advantage of the fact that it's a, a shared space and they try to gain control over it. And the tragedy of the commons is that everybody acting individually or selfishly can pull against that. And when you hit the tipping scale, there's more people acting on their own accord than with the community. You have a breaking point. And right. the funny thing is, we in, in the past, I don't know whether there's an economy of scale there, but a lot of everything from uh, the commons being managed properly has been documented in history. And when people have had big shortages, whether it's in food and drought, and uh, there's been a, at least a 60% percent where they did not abuse the commons. Sure. They all were, get, got together. and so. But I don't know if there's an economy of scale on that. Yeah. Where you have too many people with bulldozers and secret <laughs> <laughs> under the table. But we've always had secret societies. Now, heck, sure. our government uh, belonged to Masonic Lodges. Yeah. Well, 90% of our elected officials at that time. So the last I, thing I'll say is uh, George Carlin had always quoted and said, you don't need a universal conspiracy to, peop- to believe that people have like interests and have like lifestyles. Exactly. Like when they live the same, they talk about what's good for them. They don't care about what's good for the other people. They're talking about what's good entirely for their group. Hey, Warren, I have to move on to the next topic, but thank you very much for the call. Oh, by, by the way, one last thing regarding the next topic. If he doesn't bring it up, make sure he brings it up. Reforming Islam without having to uh, put yourself on the death list, you know, like uh, maybe Salman part, Rushdie. maybe part of the uh, movement here, because Faisal uh, Saeed Al Mutar definitely is on the uh, kill list in Iraq. Oh, then he's <laughs> doing his job. Yeah, he's yeah, that yeah, could be very true. Thank you for the call. Okay. 
that's a great segue into our next topic, which is the Rubin Report. David Rubin is a um, I, man. I wouldn't even call him conservative. I would say he's about as straight down the line as you could be. He's one of my favorite interviewers, so I'm going to openly admit my bias here. I know that uh, Jeremiah Bannister, the other co-host of Paleo Radio, is also very fond of Rubin, but he draws a very, very tight line. And he had again Fasal Saeed Al Mutar, who is a previous Iraqi citizen, on his show when they were talking about the struggles of trying to modernize. Islam and also just the overall issues that he's faced with the liberal left and the Muslim right in trying to reform Islam. Uh, the very first clip that we have from this interview, again, you can find it on YouTube, very easy to find, uh, David Rubin, uh, Fasal Saeed Al-Mutar on Criticizing Ideas. Uh, the very first clip is Fasal Saeed Al-Mutar talking about the catch-22 of being in the situation that he's in. Uh, when I've seen, I've watched things with you on YouTube where people will attack you for, uh, they'll attack you for yeah. being Islamophobic or that you are attacking Islam more, but clearly that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, I mean, th- the fact of the matter is like, you cannot, you cannot criticize Islam in most Muslim countries. So, even here in the West, they created some sort of like catch 22. So, if somebody is a, is a white person, like Sam Harris, or they Uh-oh. immediately get attack him as cisgender, white male, it's kind of interesting to hear to from like Muslims who don't believe in, in trans, trans rights. And, uh, <laughs> right. uh, so they, but if, you, if somebody like me, who is from the Middle East, they immediately get attack him as some sort of Uncle Tom, mass murderer. So they created Catch-22, is that in, in, the middle, in the Muslim world, you cannot criticize Islam. And if you do it in the West, you will be you will be labeled immediately as uh, as some sort as of traitor as a traitor yeah so there there you have it Fasal Saeed al mutar basically saying that there's a double standard here where on on the right certainly the muslim right you're not going to be able to criticize islam but here the liberal left seems to have an issue with that as well and i think we see that problem when when people say i understand you know like hashtag not all muslims i'm not trying to say that all people of the islamic faith are the issue but i will say that there's definite educational depravity that's going on and it happens to be happening in the middle east more often than not and when you have a lack of education you have an increase in religious fervor and whether it's the actual doctrines or not, we need to accept the fact that that is an area that needs more attention than other areas in the world. And when you have people that come from those areas that say it, Fasal Sayyid al Mutar says himself, you get this Uncle Tom status where he's somehow betraying his, his people by speaking openly about the homophobia that surrounds a lot of people in Islam. And I think that is an intricate problem that we have here in the West about trying to seriously deal with these issues. Because, yes, not all people agree with ISIS. That's true. But Pew Research polls show that a very high number of people in many, many religious, uh, Islamic religious areas believe death for apostasy is the appropriate response, as in you leave the religion and we kill you for it. And would the person throw the stone? Maybe, maybe not. But that person silently is confirming that that is a, a belief that they hold. For instance, it's easy for us to see this in in our own country. When we look at the Republicans, we look at a Republican, we say, this guy's trying to introduce bills that stop abortion, and he's trying to introduce bills that are to stop stem cell research. He's also against uh, women's rights. A lot of those are tied in with the religious connotations of their beliefs and their interpretation of their religion onto society. That same situation is happening in the Middle East, yet we don't want to call it that same situation. Uh, we've got a caller on the line. This is Dave Edwards from Ottawa, Canada. This is my buddy. Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Good. How are you, my friend? Good. Thank you for calling in. No worries. Yeah. Do you have a comment on uh, Fasal Saeed al Mutar or basically reformation in Islam in general? Or uh, just to support the show? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I think it's a long, it's, it's a long, the refer, like, in order for things to change, it's going to take just as long as it took Christianity. And, I mean, we're just in the infancy of it, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So, so I, 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 if I was, like, I would be hopeful that things will get better, but I wouldn't be expecting change anytime soon. And remember that when things start changing, the old guard is really going to kick and moan. So Yeah, yeah, and I think this is an important part is the, these countries have not been this way 
for hundreds of thousands of years. Yes, the the rhetoric has been there, and there's been small groups that have pushed this rhetoric, but it hasn't been widely accepted in Islamic culture forever. For instance, in the early infancy of Islam, we get algorithms, we get algebra, we get uh, basic and modern chemistry. We have two-thirds of the stars in the sky named in, in Arabic language and Arabic names. This is because it was a cultural center of innovation. But religious fundamentalism came by and swiped that down, and that's yeah. why I also say in the U.S. this this could happen with people who aren't vigilant about religious extremism or just religious ideologues owning office or having the office in the U.S. That that is that is true. It did have those things, but at the same time, it also had child brides, Absolutely. beheadings, massacre of Christians, massacre of Jews. Like let's not let's not. Pretend that oh it sure! Was, uh, oh no! The epicenter of all things good. No, and not to say not to say that it was a utopia by any means, but only when you brought up um, the evolution of religion. I think that's a great point. Where Christianity is about two thousand years old, Islam is about eleven hundred. It's got nine hundred years behind, and the yeah. rhetoric of Christianity, if you pushed us back to about nine hundred years, we would be about in that area. And maybe that's a general sure. statement for me to make. But simply put, if if re- if religion evolves into those doctrines are deeply held to, they're deeply held by some to, they're not necessarily deeply held and we can interpret it ourselves to, I just think of it as I'm a spiritual person. That evolves through time, and I think yeah. Islam is in a certain point of that. The, the, I think the, the, main, the main issue um, that needs to happen, and I think it would start with educating the people, is that they need to start having secular laws. I agree. Because without secular laws, there'll be zero change in those countries. Sure, the the Muslim that works at the corner store in my neighborhood, he's Westernized. He he you know he prefers Canadian life. He's gonna want a secular society. But the people that are in those countries, they don't really understand what secular life is like. So they're they're a way off, a ways off from that. Hang on one second, sorry. No, you're fine. We're going to have to let you go too, Dave, because we have to push along. (laughs) My four-year-old just told me chocolate never gets old. Oh, that's fantastic. But hey, we're going to have to let you go because we have to move on in the subject. But thank you very much for the call and the support, my brother. Yeah, no worries. Have a good one, eh? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so continuing on, this is another clip that we have from the interview with Ruben and Fasal Saeed al-Mutar on the left siding with the Muslim right and just the interesting uh, unholy alliance that that's become. But what I'm saying is if they want to just remove, if they want to use their own version of bigotry to remove him because yeah. he's a white guy, fine. But then wouldn't they look at someone like you that stands up for all those values on the left and say, this is a guy, he survived living yeah. under Saddam. He now fights to make his country and those other countries stand up for the very values that we as progressives say we're for. Yeah. And yet you don't get support out of these guys, do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I do get some, but but I, I know what you're referring to, is that the regressive left, as Majid Nawaz. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I call it the unholy alliance that happened between the liberal left and the Muslim right uh, against the the or Muslim or secular left in the Arab world. Right. And... Uh, so ironically, I mean, I, the secular left, just to put that all together, the secular left is actually lined up in a weird way with the conservative With the conservative right. right. Yes, America. which is which is very... It's bonkers. Yeah, it is extremely... Uh, I mean, they, they don't say it very publicly, but the, the fact of the matter, I mean, they apply extreme different standards to... Uh, I was speaking at UC Berkeley before I came here, and I've had also some debates in, in, in Northern California, and I told him, like, what do you call... A conservative Republican who is against gay marriage. And he said, I call him a bigot. Then he said, thank you for calling 90% of Muslims bigots. Then he said, I never said that. Right. Okay. Then I told him, if you apply different standards to different people based upon their race, and because they think that Muslim is the brown, technically. Right. So it's not even a race. Yeah. yeah. Uh, If you you apply different people, uh, different standards based upon their race, then you are actually a racist. And and there you go. I think that is one of the biggest points that Fasal Saeed al-Muttar brings up in the whole debate is if you're going to treat people differently based on their skin color, it is indeed racism. If we're going to look for – if you see someone in Islam who says, I dislike Jewish people because they're Jewish, there's not an economic socio-impact to why the person says that. That's racist. 
That is that is racism. If someone says I don't like gay people because they're gay, it, we can go. We can talk about Bush. We can talk about Cheney. We can talk about the Iraq War. But the fact is, that's because that person is homophobic. And if you want to help this cause, support people like Majid Nawaz, Ayan Hirsi Ali, and Fasal Saeed Al Mutar, who are people who are actively engaged in embracing Islam and its culture and changing it for the better. So if you support them, you're supporting the cause. Now back to Joe and Jeremiah. Welcome back to Paleo Radio here in studio at WPRR 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, and in association with Secular Media Group. I'm Joe Elder, and as live radio always is, we've had a slight switch up, and we're going to have JB in studio here right now talking to us about Team Tiny Dancer. It's true. I totally manifested about five minutes ago inside this building. You're a miraculous human being. I am, totally. <laughs> yeah. so, Other, otherworldly. So, yeah, obviously, with us being here live in studio, there have been a few changes of Paleo Radio, a few um, adjustments that we're making, and you can go ahead and talk to us about that a little bit, JB. You with know, the and, background I, and I got music. with the background music. Love I got to tell Thank you, you, Darren. Darren and, I, I love you like crazy. Hey, I, I stay on top of stuff when it comes to the music and to the uh, playlist here at the station. So, yes. yeah. Smooth yeah. as butter. Well, I'll tell you, first of all, I want to say how great it is to actually be in this building again. And it's nice to have the air conditioning. I'm not going to lie. Oh, yeah. Outside is pretty toasty here in uh, the great state of Michigan. But I, uh, we're going through serious changes, right? It's paleo Radio. And you may have noticed this, <laughs> right? <laughs> Little changes uh, being live on AMFM instead of going first to, uh, to Spreaker. And that's rooted in news that we discovered not this past Tuesday but the Tuesday prior. And what that was, was we were we were shown by the doctors Samantha's most recent uh, MRI. And that MRI, to be quite frank, is not pretty. It's not what I wanted. Uh, it's not what anybody wanted. It's definitely not what Samantha wanted. In fact, in fact, it her cancer, since the recurrence in December, her cancer has not only grown larger where it originally recurred, but it's actually spread to two different places. Uh, one of those is the other ventricle. Uh, that Her first tumor was blocking one of the ventricles, uh, the kind of the um, pools there in your brain, the dark spots, the big dark spots that fill up with fluid and go down to your spine. And so it was blocking it, and that is the reason for uh, the result being her arm and her leg and even part of her face at the time had paralysis. And she's dealt with that because of the damage that was done. Uh, she's dealt with that ever since. And so she walks, but she has a limp. She needs a brace, uh, things like that. And so the new spots of cancer are really close to the prefrontal lobe. And that has its own set of effects. And in fact, I would encourage people to go and look and to say, to find out what happens when you have cancer in your free in, in your frontal lobe what happens when you have it in the thalamus what kind of ramifications can come of this um, it's it's terrible and yeah. so uh, she has it growing there and she also has it growing near the other ventricle so there's three now we were told um, that there were no trials we were told that there weren't really many options in fact we were encouraged to kind of get off chemo um, and to and she's currently right now not on chemo. It's a dangerous situation. But we were told to bring in hospice as well to prepare the home, and it was devastating. I mean, there was no way. And that's Joe. That's when you and I record her Tuesday night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I remember you you messaged me and you said, "Hey, man, is it all right if we record on a different day?" And I'm like, "Dude, you just don't <laughs> even know, bro." Like, yes, yeah. thank you a million times. And so I thought, well, maybe we can meet tomorrow. To do it pre-recorded up in the lion's den over there at my house, where we've done it from the beginning. And the next day, we found ourselves making a lot of phone calls, trying to find any options at all, saying, is there anything anyone can do, or is this literally the time to call family? And that's the kind of stuff that was on our radar last Tuesday. Yeah. And so there was just, honestly, there was just no way in the world that yeah. there was no way emotionally, mentally. I'd read the articles. <laughs> I mean, I was keeping up with the news the best I could, and I'm just sure. like, man, I'd be, I'd be a, a freaking wreck yeah. to do this. And so um, 
I haven't posted very much since since Tuesday on Facebook, right? And part of that, you know, and I'm sorry about this, but part of it is that because I get people who say all the time, you know, what are you, you know, what's going on? What's yeah. going on? What's going on? Uh, we don't entirely know yet. We've reached out to a second opinion at University of Michigan. They've offered a different kind of chemo. What that means is that it would prolong her life and delay death. Mm-hmm. But chemo does not make cancer smaller. It just stops it from oh, growing, correct? It, right. It keeps it from the, – the, the aim of chemo is to prevent it from growing or growing too rapidly. And the three chemos, the regimen she had for months and months and months, uh, it didn't prevail. And so we have to experiment with different kinds. These are not as pleasant. These have worse effects. I can't promise her that she'll retain her hair. Mm-hmm. Right? That's, that was actually the one thing when she found out she had cancer, the one thing that made her cry. And so we're at this crazy place with chemo. That's our second opinion. We have a third opinion right now that we're waiting on, and this is the one we're kind of hoping for, that a, a doctor at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak, that he would be brave enough – and wise enough to say, you know what, let's, let's try this. Let's try low pulse hyperfractionation. And that's just a fancy pants way of saying smaller doses of radiation rather than, let's say, 200 units in 10 minutes, that blasting of it. Mm-hmm. Instead, it would be 20 units for two minutes, pause for three, 20 units for two minutes, pause for three. So rather than her having that tight mask over her face for a matter of seven to 10 minutes, she's going to have that over her face for over an hour. Yeah. At a time. That is literally the best shot that we have because radiation has proven quite effective against her kind of cancer. She has a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. And for those who don't know, who, those who are just listening, we're talking about my daughter. If you yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, probably for it, an update for the live, listeners <laughs> the live listeners who aren't listening on to Spreaker, Jeremiah's daughter, Samantha Bannister, was diagnosed with a stage three astrocytoma. Yeah, uh, anaplastic, anaplastic astrocytoma. astrocytoma. Yep. And that was in March of 2015. It's extraordinarily rare and grotesquely aggressive. And we watched within a matter of a week without any kind of chemo, without any kind of intervention. We watched in a week she went in from from limping in with a small amount of paralysis and lack of coordination with her right hand to within a week's time having total paralysis of her right arm and her right leg and her shoulder was up against her cheek and it was spasming and she could not stop it. It hurt. She couldn't stop. She would beg for it to stop. Her face looked like she had a stroke. Yeah. And that was a week. That's what kind of cancer and her her spine, it looked completely out of whack. It was over... Uh, her right shoulder blade, it literally looked like she had a major, and she did have a major problem mm-hmm. with her spine. And so we would have to carry her to use the bathroom. Yeah. you know. And that happened rapidly. And that was with no chemo. And we're in that crazy world right now with no chemo again. This, so this is a very aggressive kind. But it's also very receptive to radiation. The term the doctors used was melt. And when they went through radiation the first time, it melted it. It's the only thing that can. Mm-hmm. And so we are hoping... And we haven't heard word. And I was hoping to hear yesterday. I didn't want to come to Saturday and still not hear. Mm-hmm. And, but we didn't. And so we're still waiting on that. If, if she's able to do that, it's going to require us to take some drives away for a yeah. while. Not too long. But the circumstances, and this is wrapping it up, the circumstances of this predicament have made it not only so that we have to treat it like a fourth quarter full court press Go crazy and commit fouls if you've got to, right? Do what you've got to do. I mean, make it, you fight tooth and nail, right? Um, But also that me, individually, that I would not be able to dedicate the amount of time that I dedicate to be as prepared as I am when I approach the microphone. And people, you know, they they say they love the show. They love, in fact, we were, when we were in Washington, D.C., it was somebody named Deja. And I didn't know that she listened to the show and she was Mm -hmm. talking and she said, your show is perfect because it's only an hour long and it's so much information and it's so rapid that when it's over, your segment's over, you're like, are you kidding me? Like, (laughs) this needs to go on. That's not by accident. And I'm not pulling that. time. Right. I'm not pulling that out of my rear end either. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not like, hey, I'm just winging it, guys. Like, we, we investigate. We look into these things. We formulate our ideas. We have notes. There are things we debate that we do. for we, extensive amounts of time about what we're going to be talking about, and we debate about our own opinions and positions. And we do. And so that whole process right now is not afforded to me. 
And so Joe and I talked. We talked to Darren, uh, the manager of WPR, and we were very upfront and said, listen, we love this station. And we talked to David Smalley of Secular Media Media Group Group. and said, we talked to them and we're on good terms and to say, you know, we're committed, right? We're pumping out stuff like gold. I mean, (laughs) I mean, I mean, for real, come on. But, but the truth is, I mean, you, we wanted everyone to know and we want our listeners to know and to hear this, that we're grateful for your support, that we want to continue and that we will continue. It will be a little different. But you're going to get updates on the regular. That's the thing. You're going to get updates. And one thing that's good that's come from this is that we've discovered, well, if we're not always going to be on the air at the same time, maybe we can start making some videos. and Which is fantastic. I saw yours, by the way. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're a dapper guy. Hey, thank you. It does show that there's a silver lining, though, to this is that, you know, we – yes, it's going to be different, but it is going to continue. And we we do. We love Paleo Radio. We love WPRO Studios and Secular Media Group. And we want to continue to – keep content out for you guys and we're going to have to do it a little bit a different way but hopefully you guys will understand and in terms of jeremiah and team tiny dancer you guys can donate to team tiny dancer and help support the family uh team tiny dancer.com at gofundme or yeah. T-tiny team tiny dancer.com and of course we have a gofundme.com uh, slash team tiny dancer and, and here's the thing this is this is the absolute truth if you can't donate financially Take some time to go to the website and just see what's going on and keep updated with the family. When you guys write, people read that. It's not an empty thing. Yep. You know, this is it's there for people to have for Sam access to speaking to her and letting her know that people care about her and love her. And one other thing, and I mentioned it on South Pass on Wednesday too. Even if if you can cook dinner for uh, the Bannister family, if you can come over and help clean their house, help. In any way, shape, or form, please call the radio station. Leave your information. 616-656-2619 is the business number here. You can just leave your information, and we will get you in touch with Jeremiah and Angela and the rest of the family. And we're grateful for all of it. I mean, we're grateful. I've I've met more amazing people over the last year and a half than I've met in my entire lifetime. It's been the most traumatic, frightening, beautiful, and inspiring year ever. Nothing challenges this. <laughs> it's, it's a powerful thing, and people love her, and for good reason. I mean, it's, she's a powerful, inspirational figure. And so I just want to say I'm grateful to every single – we call you freaks and geeks, but we consider you friends. You are our friends. You're part of this whole adventure that we call Paleo Radio. And I, I'm just so grateful that there's not such a divide between my personal life and the show that the listeners don't know about what's going on with my daughter. And not just that they don't know, but man, we, that so many reach out on the regular, on a regular basis to tell us how great she is, how much they love us and what they're supporting. So I just want to thank everybody. I want to thank Darren. I want to thank Joe. Joe, you're doing a fantastic job. You're, hey, you're, you. you're obviously genius. Muy apreciado, <laughs> mi amigo. Yeah. And I, oh, what I wouldn't get to have more time and talk about Brexit, but. <laughs> oh, I, I yeah, know. Lovely. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Be, well, thank you for bringing it up to our next topic is going to be Brexit. But thank you, Jeremiah, for coming in, sharing your experience, what's going on at Team Tiny Dancer. Thank you. We will continue to get these updates every single week when we do live paleo radio segments. So I look forward to them. In the meantime, we are going to be going to break. Brexit after that. See you soon. For debates, interviews, or speeches, contact Paleo Radio Show at gmail.com. You love to hate them, you hate to love them. You just can't get enough of them, you sick freaks. Paleo Radio's on the air. Welcome back again to Paleo Radio on 95.3 FM, 1680 AM, WPRR, Public Reality Radio, and in affiliation with Secular Media Group. We're going to be talking about Brexit and the pros and cons of the Brexit. At this point, my true opinion is we don't necessarily know what the pros and cons. We're going to see some uncertainty here in the next couple you know, months, possible years. But it does not mean necessarily that all of the European Union is in shambles or that wildflowers are going to grow briskly in the fields of Britain. So I have two articles I want to cover. One is what Brexit would look like for Britain. This is by Daniel Hannon. And it's life outside the EU could be very good for us. This is by The Spectrum. He writes, what is the alternative? Well, all the options involve remaining part of the European free trade zone that stretches from the non-EU Iceland to non-EU Turkey. No one in Brussels argues that Britain would leave that common market if they left the EU. 
nor, in fairness, do remainders. Instead, they talk about the jobs being dependent on our trade with the EU, hoping that at least some of the voters will hear that the line is as dependent on our membership of the, v- of the EU itself. So in every non-EU territory from the Isle of Man of Montenegro from the Isle of Man to Montenegro has a cast or accessed the European free trade, which model should we follow? The nation arguably most comparable to Britain, being neither microstates nor ex-communist countries, are Iceland, Norway, and Switzerland. All three prefer their current deals to ours. 60% of Icelanders, 79% of Norwegians, and 82% of the Swiss oppose EU membership. Who can blame them? Norway and Switzerland are one of the wealthiest second and second wealthiest nations on earth. So there are some countries that are in the EU that are doing extraordinarily well that we wouldn't think would do well outside of the EU. However, these countries have pretty basic understandings with the EU and agreements with the EU that hold them into a lot of the main regulations that Britons are trying to avoid. For instance, the free movement of commerce and people and um, transportation. This whole entire concept in the EU is every agreement you make with the EU requires that those be part of the clause. So if you're an EU nation or signed in an EU treaty, people can f- can flow from that country to yours freely, especially for work. And the biggest British pushback for why they went into the Brexit was trying to get more control over immigration policy, which, A, I can understand that from a nationalist point of view. I don't understand why the EU gets to have a say in someone's immigration policies so much as where they should allow workers to flow freely into their country or not. So I can see where that concept comes in. The, se- the second concept is that the, U- the United Nations – or I'm sorry, the European nations have also – pushed back and taken away Scotland's right to vote in certain circumstances because their budgets weren't correct. So here they were unappointed officials in Brussels telling people in Scotland when and where they can vote and how often. And that sort of thing is a little bit too bureaucratic for me. But there's there's also the absolute downside of it. And we saw that on Thursday when after the British voters had voted to leave the European Union Immediately after that, Friday morning, there was a seismic shock to the markets. And this is the other article I wanted to get into slightly. Brexit in the markets, a seismic shock. Hey, who would have thought it? By Buttonwood is the artist who wrote it, the author. Investors are walking to a deeply unpleasant surprise. Despite the closeness of the opinion poll, most people seem to think that the status quo bias would cause Britons to vote to remain, especially as it was perceived to be their economic self-interest. A remain vote was virtually priced in. As soon as the results started to come in, the pound started to plunge from around a dollar fifty uh, before the polls closed to the pound dropping to one forty five, then one forty, and then to one thirty four, the lowest level since nineteen eighty five. It was the worst day for the sterling since the currency floated in the early nineteen seventies. The shock was also reflected in equity markets both within and outside Britain. The Nikea two twenty five average in Tokyo had dropped eight percent. When London opened, there's a big fall in the house building, retailing, and banking shares. The FTSE 100 dropped 500 points or 8% within minutes of opening. Frankfurt's DAX index fell 8.6%. S&P futures indicate a 5% decline when the markets open. In a classical risk-off move, the U.S. Treasury 10-year bond yield fell a quarter of a point in overnight trading. When U.K. markets opened, the 10-year jilt yield fell by around a third of a point to 1.05%. So we, we see a serious issue here with Britain and the serious implications of it happening fast for Brexit. But here's the thing. To be honest, folks, we'll probably cover this in a couple weeks or even months because it's so not over. There's entirely so much to talk about, particularly with is this going to be a good thing in the long run or the short one? Playing the quarterly report, absolutely not. Britain is going to suffer from this. Playing the long game, is Britain going to be more independent and have uh, their own sanctity over their own sovereign nation? Yes, they will. So we're going to see where this plays out. But again, I don't think Rome is burning and I don't think flowers are growing in Britain. Thank you guys for listening. We appreciate the love and support. We will see you all next week. You've been listening to Paleo Radio exclusively with Secular Media Group.